If you play any kind of fast paced game where reaction times affect your performance, one of the biggest factors you likely haven't considered, but could be making your progress to be a elite pro champion more difficult than it needs to be, is called input lag. It's a term that you might have heard, especially when watching things like monitor reviews, but it's not exclusive to monitors, and there are actually two different measurements that you should know about, so let me explain. First, I want to make an important distinction. Input lag, input latency, whatever you want to call it, is not the same as response time. A monitor's response time is how long the actual pixels take to change color. Once the, a new frame is already on the, the monitor's controller and is ready to be drawn. Input lag is how long it takes to get that frame ready to start being displayed. Where you measure the, the sort of start point from, though, is the key difference between what most reviewers call input lag and what most of them would call total system or click to photon latency. Let's start with the former. When a reviewer is talking about a display and they say input lag, they generally mean the time from the new frame arriving at the HDMI or DisplayPort ports to the time that the change starts being displayed on screen. The reason that that isn't instant is because the digital image that your graphics card transmits to your monitor is just a whole bunch of ones and zeros. But the panel itself needs analog voltages set for each pixel and sub-pixel, so the monitor scaler needs to do that conversion. Additionally, features like adaptive sync, overdrive, and even non-native input resolutions can effectively alter how long the, the scaler takes to do that conversion. Overdrive in particular can add processing time as the controller needs to look up what overdriven state each pixel should be set to and for how long, then modify the frame before being able to start drawing it all out. Also, providing a non-native input resolution can also cause delays, especially with the, the wrong aspect ratio, i.e. a 16x9 frame on an ultra-wide panel. Now, that doesn't mean that you know, a, a game whose uh, cutscenes are only a 16 by, an Im uh, 16 by 9 image will have that problem, as your graphics card is still actively sending a full 21 by 9 frame to the monitor, it just has a lot of black pixels on the sites. Instead, if you're actively setting your, say, system resolution to 1920 by 1080 on a 3440 by 1440 panel, the monitor will have to take the frame and then stretch it to fit its proper aspect ratio, and then also work out how those colors should be split between each of its pixels versus the pixels it got in the new frame, all before it can even start drawing, so that's going to add some delay. Now, the way that you measure that type of input lag is fairly simple. Either with a device like the Time Sleuth or with a CRT display. The CRT method is one that I know from Simon at CFT Central. Basically, because a CRT displays or draws the new frame almost instantly, you can put a fast clock on screen on both displays and then just take a picture and whatever the time difference between the clock on the CRT and the clock on the, the test panel show is what the input lag is for that monitor. That method isn't perfect and can be a, a little cumbersome to have an entire CRT monitor just hanging around for one single test, but there are some alternatives. Devices like the Time Sleuth are a great alternative as this is ridiculously easy to use. It plugs in via HDMI, it can output up to a 1080p60 signal, has a small light sensor on the bottom, which captures the, the flashing bar that it displays on screen, and lets it report up to uh, the input lag up to two decimal places of millisecond resolution and accuracy, which is pretty sweet. Now, sadly, the FPGA or Field Programmable Gate Array that powers this is a little underpowered for anything more than 1080p60. It just can't output much 
more than that, meaning that the results for higher resolutions, especially different aspect ratios, can be a, a little off. The trouble with this kind of measurement though, is that while it is a true test of the monitor and therefore is a great metric to compare displays, especially in things like reviews, it's not a real world figure. Your monitor's native input lag isn't all that significant to your gaming experience. It's only a fraction of the total input lag you will have while gaming. That's where the total system latency comes in. That is, as its other names, uh, the click to photon latency suggests, is the time between you providing an input, like a mouse click, to those photons hitting your eyeballs that display that action. That, then, is measuring not only how long the monitor it takes to process that new frame, but how long your graphics card takes to render that frame, how long it takes your CPU to update the game and tell your graphics card to render it, and how long it takes for your mouse to transmit that action, normally over USB. Since that is actually what you experience, it's a lot more of a useful metric for you, the, the end user, to know. Except it kind of isn't. See, unlike the on-monitor latency, the total system latency has so many contributing factors that you really can't compare between results that you're seeing on your system and the results that someone else is seeing, even on a similar system and identical monitors. Because the USB polling delay and the mouse debounce delay can be involved, that means that you already run a, a sort of, well, uh, with a standard mouse, anywhere between one and like eight milliseconds of sort of tolerance straight away, just waiting for the click itself, the click signal to leave the mouse and enter the computer. Then you have the processing type. Depending on everything from your CPU and GPU and what you're using there and the rest of your system hardware to the in-game settings, where you are in the game, what you're doing, who's around you, all of that sort of stuff factors in to substantially difference the results between even just single runs, let alone systems, displays, all that sort of stuff. Take this ultra wide. Playing at the full 3440 by 1440 in CSGO on low settings, uh, uncapped FPS, and using NVIDIA's LDAT tool to, well, on the center of the display with no bots in the, the game on Dust2, well, you get around uh, a rough average of about 22 milliseconds of total system latency. Now, add in some bots, run at high settings, and well, you don't get anywhere near that. You get closer to 28 milliseconds average uh, good points, or more like 40 or 50 milliseconds when there's heavy action. That is a considerable difference, despite being the exact same monitor, PC, monitor settings, exact same game, it just, that makes it a less than ideal comparative metric. That's not to say that it shouldn't be used or can't be compared. When using a consistent platform and test, like us reviewers generally do, it's perfectly fine to use and compare those results. The key is repeatability and consistency. I test with the same system, in the same position in-game, with no bots, just in case, uh, with the same you know, in-game settings, the native monitor resolution and refresh rates, basically keeping all of the variables as close to identical as possible between the tests, and running a whole load of repeats and countless shots to make sure that it's a consistent and averageable results, which means that I can relatively happily compare those numbers for a, a given panel and compare it to other tests that I've run with the same setup. How you go about testing this is much the same as the on-monitor input lag. You need a device to measure the light output of the panel, as that's still the, the end point of your test. But now you also need to be able to have it output something like a, a mouse click so that it can time between it sending that click and it seeing the image change. 
A device like Nvidia's LDAT, a latency display analysis tool, does just that. It can be configured to output automatic mouse clicks and capture the light level changes so that it can measure, like I said, the time between those events. My own open source response time tool, or OSRTT, does the same thing, and in general though, the two provide the same sorts of figures. If you don't have one of these though, you can go much more DIY and solder an LED to a mouse button. Then use a, a high-speed camera, something like my Sony RX100 Mark V-A is a great shout because it can do a thousand FPS, uh, to basically just record the, the screen with the, the LED in view, and then you just count how many frames between the LED turning on or off, however you set it up, to the, that action being displayed on screen. Now, that does give you a lot less granular results with a much wider wider margin for error, but it's an easy and cheap way to, to, to actually test this sort of stuff, so I wouldn't admonish anyone for doing it that way. So that's input lag. It's fairly self-explanatory, and just to reiterate, it isn't the same as response time. Lower input lag, both kinds actually, is always better. Although for most people, the minor differences in their peripheral systems and monitors likely isn't all that big of a deal. If you are trying to go pro though, then yeah, maybe you should start tweaking and testing to reduce that latency. Also, since I mentioned response times a, a couple of times in the video, mostly as a clarification to explain that input lag and response times aren't the same thing, if you want to learn more about response times, then you can check out the number of videos that I've done already on that. I'll leave them the cards above or on the end cards for you. Uh, those are, uh, I've done videos on both how the, you actually go about testing it, things like with my open source response time tool, but also the sort of different methodologies that us reviewers tend to use. So do check that out. This whole thing is kind of part of my open source response time tool project. So if you want to learn more about that, then check out the, the playlist that will be on the end cards as well. And uh, that's kind of that really. If I've uh, missed anything, got anything wrong, you want to see something added, or you just have any questions, feel free to leave those in the comments down below. If you want to see more videos like this one, then hit that subscribe button and turn on the bell notification icon. Like I said, check out the other videos on the end cards. If you want to support me, the open source response time tool project, or just uh, you know me making these videos, then feel free to either you know, hit the subscribe button, uh, support directly through places like the YouTube join button and become a YouTube member, get some cool rewards for doing so, or uh, become a patron on Patreon instead. You can also pick up a hoodie or t-shirt like this one or a load of other designs that I made myself. And there's a load of affiliate links for places like Amazon, Overclock UK, and a load of other stuff that you can check out in the description. And I'll also leave a link to uh, email me if you want to sort of pre-order one of the open source response time tools as well. Otherwise, thanks for watching. Apologies about the uh, bloodshot eye. I can't help it and it hurts a hell of a lot. So you'll have to live with it because I do. And uh, yeah, thanks for watching. We'll see you on the next video.